Does a Linkwitz Lab LX521 sound any good? After six years of owning them, I can tell you they're pretty damn good. I wanted to start this review by asking a pretty simple question. Why aren't there more open baffle speakers out there? Why don't we see open baffle designs all over the place? Um, and, and I'm hoping by the end of this that uh, we'll be able to answer that a little bit. Um, it's some speculation on my part, but I, ha I have a theory as to why. Um, what I wanted to do was maybe split this review up into three parts. Uh, the first being this as an introduction, um, talk about what Linkwitz Lab is, who, who Siegfried Linkwitz was, and then move on into an anatomy of the, the loudspeaker. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll go over the design of it, uh, show you the different parts, and, and tell you I'll tell you what it was like to build them. And the last um, of these is to go over the sound uh, of the loudspeaker. So, you know, I feel like uh, some of these reviews that are 30 minutes, 40 minutes long, it's just too long for YouTube and we need to, you know, put these into little more bite-sized pieces um, that are easier to digest. So uh, with that being said, let's talk about who who is Linkwitz Lab. What is, what is Linkwitz Lab? And Linkwitz, Siegfried Linkwitz was an engineer. I believe he worked for Hewlett Packard for, for a long time. Um, and I'm not sure what he engineered at Hewlett Packard, but um, audio was his side hobby, and he was very um, involved from the 70s, you know, up until he died in 2018. Um, but if you if you've been around audio at all um, over the past 40 years, you've heard the term the Linkwitz Riley crossover, which was um, a a crossover design that that he engineered back in I think 1976 and um, so he's he's fairly famous for that um, but he went on to start this sort of um, side thing called Linkwitz lab which was basically um, an outlet for him to experiment and do some of these things that he wanted to do um, and he, he sort of created a community um, through his website that was dedicated to kind of DIY um, speakers for people like him that um, just kind of wanted to build their own stuff. And so he, he would design things and release them on his website. And basically you would, you would buy the intellectual rights to make a pair. So you didn't actually, you didn't actually buy much of anything from uh, Siegfried himself. What what you bought was um, a set of plans for how to build it. And when I first started, I think in maybe 2011 was when I first got wind of who Linkwitz Lab was. Uh, at the time, the top of the line was the Orions, and all, the Orions were. Similar to the LX five twenty ones, and they were in that they were fully open baffle dipoles, um, but the upper part of it was um, just a two way. So it was an eight inch uh, magnesium driver, and then a tweeter at the top. And um, it's the design has now changed into um, a three way up at the top, which is two mid ranges and a tweeter. Um, but um, so, you know, I, I don't, 
I was very happy with my Orions for many years. And so I didn't feel the need to upgrade. And then I sort of checked back in with Linkwitz Lab at one point and, and realized that he had come out with the LX521s. Um, so I was maybe a little late to the party in some ways on that latest design, which uh, we're talking probably 2015 maybe. Uh, that I got wind of them. And by that time, they were already in their point four designation, which is what I understand the point four designation to be is when uh, he took the active crossover and they became um, a, a fully active crossover for all the drivers. I think in some previous iterations, um, he had a passive crossover between the two mid-range drivers instead of it being part of the active crossover. So I think the point forward designation is 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 taking the full, uh, you know, active crossover all the way to each driver. Um, so what exactly is a dipole? Uh, if you don't know, you know, you hear these terms open baffle and dipole. Um, Basically, what that means is the drivers don't have a cabinet behind them. So the back wave of the drivers is free to propagate the room. Um, and so what the term dipole means that um, when the driver gets a signal, it, it pushes the driver forward in the baffle, which shoots a sound wave at you. And then as that driver returns back to its resting position, it is creating an, an, an exactly opposite wave in phase going backwards, the other way of the driver. And so what you have is, is one phase going in the front and exactly the same but opposite phase going in the back. And what happens is when those two phases wrap around the baffle and meet in the in between like basically right at the plane of the baffle they cancel each other out and so what you have is very little output at the very sides of the baffle um and linkwitz always talked about using that cancellation to your benefit in a room by basically aiming that edge of the baffle that's producing almost no sound toward your first reflection point uh, at the sidewalls. Um, and, you know, it was one of the ways that you could mitigate the amount of influence the room had on the speaker sound. Um, and the reason that, that these kind of have this odd shape that they do is because Linkwitz was trying to create even dispersion throughout all the frequency ranges. Um, and so that's why that baffle is such an odd shape, uh, is because he is using that shape to control dispersion and make it even across all the frequencies, basically. Um, so, you know, room considerations for, you know, if you, if you have a pair of these, they like to have room around them. And if you, if you look at the Linkwitz Lab website, they recommend at least one meter to any major reflective surface. Um, so that's side walls, back walls, whatever. Um, what I found in my long-term ownership is that they like you know, a very long distance to the to the front wall. I believe mine, the front baffle of my loudspeakers to the back, to the front wall is um, over six feet, I think. It's closer to seven feet. And, you know, I, I find that if you can give them that kind of a distance, that they disappear even more. Um, if you have a room where you need to keep them tight up against that front wall, you're not going to hear them at their best. 
Um, and so, you know, they, they don't like a tiny room. They're not going to work fantastically in a tiny room. You need a medium size to large room to make them sing at their best. Um, and I think, you know, my room would be in the medium sort of category. And I, you know, that they work fabulously down here. Um, so there, there's a couple options for, for acquiring these. Um, so I built mine six years ago. Um, and at that time, that was the only way to get a pair was to build them yourself. Um, he, Siegfried himself was not interested in, uh, you know, operating a factory, you know, producing products, selling that product. This was strictly a side, you know, thing he did for fun. And it, it also made it so that you could afford this thing. Um, and he, you know, he did a great service to, to the audiophile community by, by basically, you know, letting anyone build a pair, um, at a much cheaper price than, than you would ever see it in a retail location. Um, but now since Linkwitz died in, in 2018, he, he left, um, you know, basically the, the rights to this loudspeaker to a guy in Germany who runs Linkwitz.store. And that is a resource for, um, a couple of different options for building it. So, um, you can still do it the way I did it, which is to build a pair yourself, to buy the intellectual rights to build a pair. And, you know, you get a, you get a set of instructions on how to build it, the dimensions for all the cabinets, all of that stuff, and it's up to you to build it. Um, the, the, the crossover is available separately to buy, uh, fully assembled. I, I remember, I built my first crossover I bought the boards directly from Linkwitz. Back this is back when I built my Orions. I assembled that crossover myself, uh, and it was it was a big task. It was not easy. I had never really done a lot of electronics before, um, and it was not a simple task. I have a much better appreciation for how electronics get built because of that, for sure. Uh, it takes a long time to populate these boards with through hole resistors and capacitors etc solder them all clean them all up all that stuff um but now now you can buy as i have the second time around i bought uh the analog signal processor from hairball audio but they also have it now available um and, and i think they've actually uh, eliminated the DSP option that used to be back when I built mine. I think that was the only other option was a DSP option, and I think in a previous video I misspoke and said that that was the way you got it from the Linkwood store. But since doing some research, um, that is actually not true. You're getting you're going to get an analog um, crossover now, um, and. He, you can also buy, you can buy all the drivers, you can buy cables, you can buy connectors, you can buy um, basically the whole loudspeaker, um, you know, it, to, to make them yourself. Um, all the resources are there on that website. But you can also buy a ready-made speaker that's already done. And, you know, the base price, I think, for the loudspeaker itself with no other parts of it, meaning no, no amplification, no ASP, all that stuff, uh, for 13,900 euros. Um, if you want to include uh, digital amplification, or not digital amplification, but Class D amplification and an analog signal processor that jumps the price to something like 19,900 19, euros. Um, and, you know, I think if, if you did in, in all in the DIY world, um, I think we're talking about minimum 6,000, you know, not including all the labor it takes yourself to, to make a pair of these cabinets. Um, 
So it's probably over 6,000 uh, to make a pair today. Um, and I, I think to, to answer my original question, why aren't there more open baffles? I, I have a feeling that it, it relates to um, the way that you, you, these phase cancellations between the front wave and the back wave happen in the base. And I think there's a significant amount of base loss that occurs because of that. And so I, I have a feeling that that may be the reason that you don't see a ton of them. You know, Pure Audio Project, Spatial, uh, there's a few other small ones. Um, but it, and you'll often see them do, like I'm thinking of Nola, who does open baffle upper sections, but not the base. The base section is a, usually a sealed box or a ported box. So I have a feeling that that is the challenge of an open baffle and why you see um, drivers that are so large, 15-inch, 12-inch drivers, multiple of those on a lot of these open baffle designs because they're compensating for the base loss that you get from the phase cancellation um, as they wrap around the loudspeaker. Uh, and um, so the next video, we'll, we'll go over the anatomy of a Lankwitz. See ya. Let him